Um, I'm Steve Benson, the founder and CEO of Badger Maps, which is the number one route planner and mapping system for salespeople who are specifically out in the field, you know, salespeople meeting their customers face to face. And of course, Badger is, uh, is comes integrated with Zoho. Um, today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, how to successfully coach your sales team to drive sales efficiency. So every sales manager wants their team to close bigger deals. Think about this. How much would revenue go up if your entire team was closing deals like your very best sales rep? Imagine the rep who generates the most leads in your team. What if every rep was prospecting as well as that rep? How much more revenue would your sales team bring in? Today, we're gonna to learn how to make that happen. Your team's success starts with the manager. So let's talk about how to manage a sales team so that every rep performs at their absolute best. First, a great sales team starts with a manager who's also a great coach. How is a good soccer coach different than a bad soccer coach? You know the concept of means and ends, right? Well, so a, a bad soccer coach just tells you the desired end, but doesn't help you with the means on how you can accomplish that. For example, they, they might tell their team to play better defense or be mad at their team that they're not scoring enough. A good soccer coach, on the other hand, identifies the specific skills team members could improve to enhance their performance. They provide their players with insights into how they could be better, and they create drills to help the team achieve their goals. For example, they might say to a left forward, hey, on your right side crossover, it, it could be done like this to get an extra jump on the defender. Go practice that like this, and or whatever the skills is, skill that they're talking about is. And that's the same strategy great sales managers can apply to their sales team. Uh, here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna launch a few poll questions during this webinar. Um, the first question I have to, to better understand our audience here today, just so I can tailor things, is what type of sales team does your company have? Anyway, the point being for, for sale for great for uh, for managers to apply this to their sales team this concept of being a great coach as a manager you've got a deeper level of insight into your whole sales team you understand their performance better than anyone else and you also know the strengths and weaknesses of the individual members of the team it's your job to improve their weaknesses but before you can improve their weaknesses you need to recognize their strengths. The first step to doing this is to, is to ask yourself, which skills determine whether my team succeeds or fails? Then you break down, you break the sales process down into those skills, meaning, so you'll end up with a few key skills for each stage of your sales cycle. Once you've identified the key attributes and skills that make your reps succeed or fail, rate each rep on your team on how good they are on a scale from one to 10 in each skill. Measuring this can feel a little subjective, but the, the goal is to identify who's really good at a given skill so that they can be the model for the others they, and they can teach the others. If no one on the team is good at a certain skill, you can always tap your network, tap an expert or a consultant to fill in on a certain area. Use your judgment and use historical sales data about your team to rank your reps from from one to ten in each one of these categories and we'll go through which one, what those are uh, but for example you know use your historical sales data from your zoho crm and you know because the data in zoho is very powerful you can identify who has the best skills in a certain area on a on your team you can look at sales metrics such as the number of sales meetings uh, how many calls they're getting, how many closed deals they have of a certain type over a certain period. And you can use those, you can use that data to identify the strengths and weaknesses across your team. So 
a 10, if you ranked a rep, rep, you rank all your team members, and if you ranked someone a 10, it would be the highest a rep could potentially perform at a, at a given skill. For example, a 10 in timely and relevant follow-up means that your rep could not do this particular skill any better than they're currently doing it. Uh, it can also help to ask your team members and, and get their feedback on what they think they're good at and also what they perceive other people on the team to be particularly good at. And you can you know, just bring this up in your one-on-one. Say, who, who, what are you good at? What, what are other people good at? Ask them how they feel about their performance and what parts of the sales process they like the most. Wh which ones do they like the least? You can even have them score themselves and grade themselves on each skill in your ranking system. You can collect their feedback and then put the self-evaluated score next to the ranks you assigned. And, and that can be a, uh, an educational process and kind of you know, shine light on some things. Self-evaluation, you know, it's obviously a really powerful tool and, and it can help you as a manager to get their self-evaluation. Uh, in, in my experience, you, you might actually notice that the reps who are honest and aware of their performance and where they're strong and where they're weak, they're often the most coachable and may improve the fastest. In, in those same one-on-one -on -one conversations, one -on -one conversations with your reps, um, you can also ask them to talk about who they feel is great at other skills on the sales team. You can, who do they turn to for help when there are particular questions about the product or you know, who do they think is the best negotiator? Reps tend to notice when their peers are particularly good at something, and and they'll reach out to them when when they need when they need help. Let, so you can leverage their eyes on each other. You only have one set of eyes, but you know a great leader leverages the knowledge of the whole team. So be sure to ask uh, the people on your team's opinions. You don't need to show your ranking list to the team necessarily. The point is to to give you a clear view of who's good at what so that you can have the most talented people share their skills and knowledge with the rest of the team. Compare your opinions with what the reps thought about themselves and about their peers. Now, you've, if you've gone through all these steps, you really have a list of your reps in order, and they're stack ranked in order of their abilities. Now, pay special attention to the top performer in each skill set because they can become your go-to resource for improving your sales training and getting the rest of your team up to speed. Now it's so now we can put this coaching plan into action. You can you can divide your coaching plan by skill set that will maximize the ROI of each rep's training. Most reps don't need new hire type sales training all over again. They just have to Build their skills in the one or two opportunity areas where they have the they have underdeveloped skills that are holding them back from from really being their best. So now that you know who on the team needs help, and you also know who on the team is in the best position to help them, so you can put a plan together to make that happen. Because now you've identified the key skills that reps need to be successful, and you figured out who's good at what. So now you turn those reps that are good at stuff into coaches of the reps for the reps that are not as good as stuff. So at a given skill set. First step there, meet with your top ranking reps and discuss their strengths and weaknesses with them. No matter how great they are, they aren't perfect. Nobody is. So coach your best reps so that they know how to train the rest of the rest of the team. People aren't born leaders, right, or born coaches, so they, you, you might want to help develop them in this area. So spend a few days shadowing your top rep, looking for opportunities to improve their weaknesses and getting to, and, and understanding how they're utilizing those particular strengths. Analyze their schedule. How do they, how do they use their time in order to operate at such a high level? As a manager, your job here is to help your your sales reps understand the subtle things they're doing that make them stand out amongst their peers. They, they might e not even notice what they're doing is special. They, they may even not realize it. For example, it, you know, they, they might assume that everyone closes deals in a certain way that, 
you know, the, a guy that you're looking at who's a really good, great closer, they may not realize, oh, I'm, I'm doing this special thing, but but you can watch them and identify, oh, this is what you're doing. This is why you're so successful at that. Then you can help them understand why they're good at something, and that will help prepare them to communicate what they're doing exactly with the rest of the team. Even, you know, even the best reps aren't necessarily the greatest coaches. It's common. The greatest practitioners are, are often not the greatest coaches. I think it was Einstein struggled as a college professor. And, you know, it was, it was probably hard for him because he was so far removed from the elementary aspects of physics. And so his lectures were super dry and hard to understand. And literally, he was Einstein. So, so the lesson there for your reps, the it's a it's a skill to be a coach and and the skill that you've identified in them that they're so good at you know they they don't necessarily off the top of their heads know how to teach others to be great at it they may still need to put some thought and some elbow grease into transferring that knowledge effectively also don't just look at what they're doing differently but look at how they're performing the activities they're especially good at. For example, watch how your top reps plan their day, decide what to do first, organize their information, prepare for sales calls. Find the details that really create champions. Uh, you want to find the obvious ones, like getting to work early, but also the less obvious traits, like the body language they use when they're with prospects or how to overcome, how they overcome certain types of, of common objections. So now that you understand how important it is to turn your best reps into coaches for the rest of the team, let's take a closer look at the critical skills you should be looking to identify in your reps that they, they, they might be particularly good at and therefore able to transfer their knowledge to the rest of your team. A few examples of the types of skills that can determine how – can really make a rep more successful. Um, first, prospecting and building rapport, qualifying, negotiating, preparing for sales meetings, giving persuasive sales presentations and closing, the ability to overcome objections, and finally, timely and relevant follow-up. Now, we'll go through these skills one at a time and – Think about how to identify them. All right, now I'm going to try this this poll thing again. This one I think will work. Um, I, I made the first one wrong, I think, but this one should work. So let's see if we can get this up here. So which which sales skill does your team need the most help with? Oh, this is fun. I can see the, the, the answers rolling in here. I won't bias everyone by telling by saying what people are saying the most. <laughs> um, very cool. So, well, uh, the, the top thing was uh, prospecting um, and qualifying. So we'll start with uh, prospecting and building rapport. And I think this is honestly one of the biggest things uh biggest things out there so i'm not sure that it pulled so well for this skill you'll want to watch for things like how your top rep starts a call how they establish a full rapport and become friendly with the prospect how they personalize your offering to the prospect what unique phrases they may use early in the relationship and how do they ask the prospects to take the next step Finding the right opportunities is the first key to beating your quota. And doing this well depends on a lot of different factors, including the number of leads the rep is contacting. Um, but really, the, the proper technique will help everything else fall into place. Tonality can pay, play a big role in how your sales reps are perceived by buyers. Pay attention to really how you're your rep approaches prospecting and building rapport so that you can help them get ready to communicate their approach. 
Next, we have qualifying. So that was the that was the other big big uh, high scorer in our little poll there. So qualifying prospects is is probably the most underrated part of the sales process. Honestly, it, it great qualification ensures your reps aren't wasting time with people who don't have the ability to make purchasing decisions. So look at how does your best rep decide which leads to approach? How do they score the leads they find? Do they do that you know, in a written formal form or are they just do it, doing it in their head? How do they phrase and have a qualification conversation? How do they work those questions in? And then how do they prioritize their prospects and opportunities taking all that data into account? Qualifying the right opportunities, well, it, it makes every step in the sales process after that easier. A lot of sales reps aren't thoughtful enough about the qualification aspect of sales. Maybe it's because salespeople are, are often optimistic by nature, but instead they can chase after deals that had signals that they were unlikely to close or unlikely to close soon and need more nurturing. And this is, when they do this, it's arguably the biggest time waster on sales teams. So help your reps who are best at qualifying figure out what makes their approach successful and what they're doing effectively to qualify their opportunities and prioritize the best ones. The next skill um, that also pulled highly uh, to figure out who on your sales team should teach other people negotiation. Think about how important it is that your sales team brush up on their negotiation skills. If they, if they could close an average of 10% more deals and close them for 10% more revenue, it's worth a tremendous amount to your company. Because this is such an obvious win, it probably gets an outsized share of existing education, honestly. But the trick to having a rep who's great at it teach the others is that so much of being a great negotiator is unique to your product, your deal size, your market position, your competitors, et cetera. You know, like a, even a negotiation expert can't step in and negotiate better than your, your best rep probably because they know all this stuff. So learn what, what, what is your best negotiator doing that enables them to, enables them to be so successful and then then they can share those skills with the rest of the team. Understand the details around how your best rep prepares for a sales negotiation. Look at how they organize and interpret the details of the deal. Uh, check out how they, they draw out and overcome last minute objections. And finally, how do they present the contract to the customer? How do they position that? Help your top rep collect everything he or she is doing into a play playbook that they can teach the rest of the team. Negotiation is not only an art and a science, but it's also highly situational. Consider filming your best rep doing mock negotiations, and that can create a resource that lives on uh, that the team can use later when a new hire comes on or whatever. Having your best reps reveal to your team the list of things to keep in mind, such as never offering discounts on certain deal sizes or leading with one offer while having an upsell in mind. That'll help everyone on the team strengthen their negotiation skills. The next uh, key skill we're gonna talk about is preparing for sales meetings. So the first thing to do is look at how your top rep in this skill is doing their research before the initial call. They probably understand what the prospect does before making the first call, like they understand their business and what drives it. Then they likely research the prospect's website and they understand what's going on in their industry. Pay attention to which tools your top reps are using to do this. For example, they might look at the prospect's LinkedIn profile for commonalities or things to talk about and, and just to know who they're talking to and what's going on. The, see if they keep track of important things in their Zoho CRM so that they can quickly refresh their mind right before each meeting, because it's hard to keep everything top of mind all the time. After doing appropriate research, 
to be prepared for a meeting, reps should generally have a pre-call before the meeting. I strongly recommend this. Prospects, especially if they're the sponsor or champion who's already put some of their social capital on the line to bring you in to present to the group, those types of people are often really happy to oblige if you ask them, would you like to have a five minute prep call before the call with the full group so that we can make sure everything goes smoothly? Um, once a rep has the champion on a call, a good thing to ask is something like, just so I make sure I focus the demo on what's most important to you guys, what's the main goal you want to achieve with this call? What, what are you hoping to see? A pre-call done like this can make sure that everyone's really on the same page. It lets your rep learn why the prospect wants to have a presentation, what the pains are, if, and find out if, the, if, if they have the budget to solve this or if the budget comes from a part of a bigger project, what the decision process looks like. You can really, you can pull, it's a great time to pull out key information. Lastly, you'll likely notice that your top reps will be extremely aware of who's going to be in the room. Remember, every deal has at least one proponent or champion at the prospect company. You know, the person who works uh, works there as, a, as an employee and really wants your solution to be a part of the company. Try to understand how this person benefits both personally and professionally from purchasing your product or solution. Great reps will arm this champion with all the tools they need to convince the other stakeholders to pursue the transaction and get your deal done. At the same time, there's, all, there's often an opponent of the sale, someone who objects to doing business with you. You know, maybe they just don't like spending the money or they don't see the value. There can be a ton of reasons fueling the opposition to, to your deal. It, a, a head of engineering may prefer to build the technology in-house. A head of finance may disagree with the financial benefits. A team lead may suffer decreased staff or a decline in power or reduced, reduced importance as a consequence of, of this new product or service being a part of the organization. You need to arm your champion to win an argument with this opponent and your rep probably won't be in the room when this argument happens, which is why the arming process is so important. Finally, there's the decision maker. Maybe it's the CEO or the CFO, but the ultimate person who must be convinced to go or no go. He, he or she often has a different perspective than either the proponent or the opponent of the sale. Other stakeholders, you know, they, they vary by product price and sales process i mean find out if you're but find out if your top rep is aware of all these different stakeholders that may influence the decision making process and how they go about identifying and approaching each of them this is a uh, this is such a crucial skill that you can have your rep that's the very best that it spread to your other reps the next skill that you'll want to figure out who on the team is good at is giving persuasive sales presentations and closing. Notice that I put giving your presentation and closing into one section, which is why why did I do why did I do that? Most people would call giving a presentation one skill and closing another skill. People think of closing as some you know magical fairy dust trick that some reps just have and some reps, reps just don't. But the reason no one can actually figure out what that trick is is that actually the trick to closing is in how you sold during your presentation in the first place so that's why i put them together so okay so there's there's six things that we'll discuss that will help your reps give successful sales presentations to be successful as a sales rep you have to get in the right mindset listen to the customer and adjust the message before you start presenting you need to uncover the business value of your product for the prospect you need to be confident saying no or I don't know. You need to avoid relying on your deck. And finally, you need to communicate with confidence. When working with your top performing rep in this skill, you need to find out how they implement these steps and what makes their approach stand out. So let's discuss these steps briefly and think about what it takes to do them successfully. First, Get in the right mindset. 
don't sell, communicate value. Genuine passion and have have a genuine passion and a positive attitude, show confidence, and that builds trust. Listen to the customer and adjust your message before you're presenting. Ask yourself, why did the prospect agree to meet? Get the prospect to describe their pain points and now adjust the presentation to this new information. Uncover business value. Get the prospect to understand the value of solving their problem. Use concrete numbers to quantify the value. Be confident with saying no or I don't know. Don't, don't make assumptions. Build credibility by being a partner to, with your, to your customer and looking for a solution. Don't just rely on the sales deck. Interact with people in the meeting. Use the deck only as a reference and to summarize the value and pain points solved. Communicate value with confidence. To do that, just don't show nervousness. Nervousness, use confident body language and project confidence with your voice. Next, I want to move on to talking about the benefits to the strategy of anticipating price objections. Over the years, I've seen even reps who are great at overcoming most objections aren't prepared to do a really great job at overcoming price objections. No matter how experienced they are, it can throw them off their whole game. So let's let's dive let's dive deeply into how how to handle price objections. The best way to overcome price objections is to not overcome it. Instead, Look for your reps to anticipate the price objection and cover it during a sales call so they won't even have to overcome the objection. The, when it comes time to close the deal, the objection has already been removed because of that anticipation and dealing with it early. The key to overcoming an objection, and this is really true of any objection, but especially the price objection, is to not wait for the prospect to raise it, but to own the objection by raising it first and dealing with it up front. And this is counterintuitive. Pay attention to how exactly your top performing sales rep at closing is lowering the prospect's resistance by addressing the objections and concerns throughout the entire sales meeting. By bringing things up proactively, they'll increase their credibility and show that they deeply understand the prospect. Your best rep in this skill will likely anticipate the price objection and bring up price before your customer does. Let's talk about the specific steps you need to look for in your top rep's behavior when it comes to anticipating and handling the objection before the prospect brings it up. First, how do they bring up the objection and empathize? A good thing to say might be, a lot of people ask about price, and that's always an important thing to talk about. How do they let the prospect know that they can resolve the objection? Are they focusing on the value of your product or service? Um, we'll take the objection, the, the example of Badger Maps, the company I run, because I'm familiar with that. One of my reps might say, once a sales team is using our mapping tool, the value is really clear, but like a lot of things, uh, until it's up and running, there are always a lot of questions. So we recommend trying the product out in our free trial so that you can truly understand the value that you'll get from the product. Take note of how your best rep demonstrates why the price is appropriate, taking into account where the prospect is coming from. There could be two situations here that your top rep needs to handle differently to be able to teach the team. First, uh, either the customer has decided to buy something but is still deciding between you and your competitors, or second, they're trying to decide to buy from you or do nothing. So let's talk about the first scenario first. How does your best rep hold up against your competitors? Look at how your top performing rep acts in a situation where they find themselves up against a low cost competitor. Maybe he or she says something like, although our price is initially higher, our product costs less over time because it does more, it works better, and it integrates with your other systems. 
So you get a lot more value out of it. When you see the two next to each other, it's pretty clear why the total cost over time is lower and what you get out of it is worth a lot more with us. Let me show you how. A response like this shows that your top rep is able to convince the prospect of the higher value of your product and overcome the price objection. So let's do the second scenario. Your rep is up against the status quo. So you buy your product versus do nothing. When your reps find themselves up against the option of doing nothing, it's important that they can show how much the prospect won't gain slash will lose if they don't take action and buy the product. If you, you're showing them how much they're going to lose. And many studies show that for some reason, people hate losing things, but they're not as bothered about giving up potential gains. So think about that. Because we all, we, we all do it, and it causes us to make irrational decisions, this bias towards being just hating losing things. Effectively showing the ROI of your solution is a great way to accomplish showing the prospect what they will lose, maybe on a monthly basis by, by not doing not, not getting your service. Is your top rep able to show them on a dollar value what they're going to be losing every month if they don't use your product? Because they're probably going to be make, making a lot of sales if they can. Because that helps them make their case and convince a prospect to act when the other alternative that the prospect was considering was inaction. It's important that they can break down how they handle this and uh, and and what skills they're they're using, and then they can teach that to the rest of the team. As a last step, after your rep has made their point, see how they verify that last objection and see how it's been overcome to get the nod that the price is appropriate. So, what do I mean by this? They they should mention concrete numbers again saying something like, does that sound right given this analysis that your organization is losing $20,000 a month by not having this solution in place? If the prospect is nodding their head and your product or service costs $2,000 a month, the rep really probably has the sale. And, and it's because they've demonstrated that they're great at overcoming the price objection. So now, you know how to identify and coach your best rep in overcoming a price objection by anticipating it, in a, and we've gone over it in a pretty detailed way. Uh, however, you should keep in mind that sometimes when prospects bring up a pricing objection, they could actually have another objection in mind that they aren't even saying, they're just, they're, they're leaning on price as their excuse. And that leads to a whole other challenge that your reps need to overcome. So how does your best rep identify and understand the true nature of an objection? When someone objects to the price, there are actually four objections that could actually be the true objection that are just hidden behind the price objection. One, that your rep has not shown enough, shown that your product is valuable enough, so they don't see the higher value as being worth it compared to the price. Second, that there are cheaper substitutes to your product. So even though they want something here, there's a cheaper version, so they're not gonna buy yours, they're bringing up price. Um, third, that they're afraid to spend that much money on a product or solution that they still feel is risky. Or finally, that they truly don't have the money. So let's let's go through these um, through these deeper objections in a little more detail. Number one, the prospect does not understand the product's value. So for this one, does your rep verify that they understand the prospect's problem? Does your rep show them how your solution solves the problem? And does your rep quantify what solving the problem is worth the prospect in real dollars, right? Second, there are cheaper substitutes for your product. Does your rep know the industry really well? Know the competitors and and know be able to are they able to talk about it like it's the back of their hand? Um, do we talk about the back of our hand? I'm not sure. 
<laughs> that was a test. Uh, is, is your rep an expert in your competitor's products and do they know their weaknesses? Your, your reps need to know and show why your product will create more business value and be less risky than the cheaper product. The third true objection, the prospect is afraid to spend that much money on a product or solution because it still feels risky. So your reps need to put their, themselves in the prospect's shoes here. They need to empathize. They need to, they need to, the, the prospect needs to be reassured that your solution will work for them. Your best rep, need, they'll, they'll make the, the customer feel secure and safe that that and maybe they'll do this with case studies maybe they'll do this by having them talk to other customers but a lot of times the reason people don't buy something is because if they buy if they spend money and it doesn't work or damn you know messes up operations etc they could be putting their job at risk right identify strategies that your top performing rep uses like l leveraging these customer testimonials or introducing prospects to current customers in that way the uh, you know they'll be able to sh the other reps can learn how they do that. Finally, if the prospect truly doesn't have the budget, you know this this could mean the prospect really doesn't have the money, or they have some money but not enough for full price, which is really two different situations. If the product if the prospect really just doesn't have the money, they don't have access to the funds, your your rep can take steps to help them purchase the product even if they don't have the money right now. So one strategy they can use to make this happen, you can offer the first two months free and then charge them monthly after that. Um, that way the product can pay for itself. And I've, I've used this strategy literally a million times at Badger because, you know, a, a lot of times, so with our product, the, the gas saved from having a route app connected to Zoho it, you know the the gas the gas costs more than the final price that a company is paying for our solution. So, from a financial perspective, if we give them two months free, then the gas starts paying for the for the the solution, and so they've the the by the third month they're they're not paying anything because they're just the savings in their gas they're paying us and they're paying us for the product. So the product is basically free forever. So that's if they don't have the money, that can be a really powerful way of doing it is just kind of give them like a trial and try out the product and they're like oh this is paying for itself great well we can keep we can keep paying we can keep we can keep doing it and that's a great thing maybe you're if especially if the prospect is too low in the organization have as, a, access to the budget but they're but they're high up enough in the organization that they you know they own the problem great time to use that strategy the other situation is the prospect has some money but not enough to pay you your full price and so this is where discounting comes in so i i like to never give discounts i like to never give discounts but to make um price adjustments um this opens the door for negotiation and but your product keeps its full value in the prospect's eyes and a price adjustment should always be a win-win um so uh, that means you're trading for something, right? Like they're giving they're giving you a case study in exchange for a discount or something like that. Um, but it's not a discount. It's you know this for that a trade. So next, uh, following up after a sales meeting, uh, it's one of the most powerful tactics. Doing this right is one of the most powerful tactics to accelerate the sales cycle. There are five important aspects to following up. First, planning when to follow up. Second, setting, setting up your follow-ups to keep your prospect engaged. Third, using different methods of following up. Fourth, reinforcing and reiterating your products or product or your services value. And five, and this is a tough one for people, knowing when to walk away. When you've identified the rep that's best at following up, shadow and work with them to understand how they go about each skill. Okay, so let's go over these five things in more detail. This is super important. First, planning when to follow up. Follow up right after the meeting. Procrastination leads the, to losing the deal to the status quo every time. Create urgency towards 
implementing your product. People buy when they're ready to buy, not when you're ready to sell. Uh, for calls and emails, here's a here's a trick. Uh, best time of day is or best days are, two, are Wednesday and Thursday, and the best time is often from two to four p.m. Uh, you, you'll always see that your best rep won't procrastinate and will set a follow-up at the best time for each prospect. Second, setting up the follow-ups properly. Is your rep asking for permission to follow up and learning what way to follow up works best for the prospect in their original meeting? Your top reps stand out by focusing on paving their way for future follow-ups to the prospect. Third, how to follow up using different methods, follow up over email, phone, text, voice, and in some cases, invitations to conferences or webinars, but they keep the conversation going. Your best reps will work to stay top of mind for their prospects. For the first touch after a meeting, um, which is often a, a thank you email, your rep should send a note, thank the prospect for their time, and include valuable information. They shouldn't pitch or try to close here. Does your best rep thank the prospect for their time? Do they mention a key takeaway from the meeting? Do they address next steps for both sides? Fourth, reinforce your product's value. So here's one tip, personally connect with the prospects. How does your top rep build rapport and find things that they have in common with the prospect? The second is reinforce value. Repetition is key. Your best rep uses repetition, very likely uses repetition, and knows when the prospect has truly understood the value of the product. Fifth, and this is the hard one, knowing when to walk away. You don't want your team to waste their time. But that being said, 80% of deals take more than five follow-ups, and 44% of salespeople stop after the first follow-up. The five attempts follow-up strategy is a rule of thumb, but some deals may take more interactions. Your top rep will often have great judgment on this and great instincts because they don't they they end up not wasting their time if they do this well. Your best rep will understand the difference between when a prospect says no, not now, or not yet. If the prospect says not yet, does your best rep ask when? the best time for the next follow-up is. Um, how does your best rep send a breakup email before ending the relationship? Because sometimes that can dislodge things or, or get the truth to come out in terms of what the prospect's thoughts are. Okay, so let's zoom out and bring this all back together. You've just identified the skills that a sales rep needs to be successful on your team. On your team. You've figured out who has the deepest expertise in each of those skills now it's time to execute and enable your best reps in each skill to teach the rest of the sales team how to also master those, those key skills. In the next step, you need to prepare your top reps to clone themselves and coach their peers. Group training sessions are an easy way to get everyone on the same page here. The top performing rep can show the rest of the team how to utilize their techniques with situational exercises, role playing, the rep teaching the class can demonstrate their skill live, and, uh, and and or if your sales team is remote, you can do it with a you know with a go to meeting or or whatever um, over the computer. I personally have found that in person training is a lot more engaging, and people learn better in person when they can do exercises that really engage them. But that's not obviously always an option. Uh, the reps that are learning will probably pay close attention to, to the lesson because they're likely to know that it's their peer who is teaching them and giving them the tips and tricks that they need to be successful and it's their peer that's all that they know is so good at this so uh, it's also worth keeping in mind that having an opportunity to teach the rest of the team a skill or an ability is a, a fantastic opportunity for for your top reps to develop their leadership skills, and that's that's important to keep developing leaders on your, leaders on your team. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna launch my my second poll question now. Do you currently utilize peer to peer coaching in your sales team? Let me launch this here. All right.
Okay, well, a, a lot of no's. So this is a huge opportunity that we've taught, learned how to do this today, because this is, uh, this is, this is very powerful. It's very powerful stuff. This peer-to-peer -peer coaching and teaching in this way. I mean, I'm surprised how few are actually using this sort, these sorts of skills already. Um, well, um, you know, how do you do this? You can host these training sessions as a part of a weekly meeting or at the monthly, quarterly, or annual meetings. I like to have skills taught regularly, and I like to make learning a regular part of the cadence of the job on sales teams that I run. You're likely to get better results in terms of knowledge retention and skill development if you teach new skills for one hour a week than if you cram 10 hours a day straight for a week at the annual kickoff. It's better to spread it out over the year. This process can also uncover who on the team needs extra help with something. Pay attention to the reps who haven't improved after the group training sessions and have your expert reps mentor these reps personally. They can meet with them one-on-one -on -one and discover their problem areas and help them overcome it. Make sure you Make sure to document the breakthroughs that help them improve for anyone who has similar issues in the future. Um, you can create valuable training materials through this process and you can continue to update them along the way as living, breathing documents. This obviously, this all takes time, but the results of improving your team, will, I think will, will really show up in your sales results. If your coaching strategy works, your entire team will, will start closing more deals. And by turning your best reps into coaches, you, you really you set the standards for the rest of the team. This also helps you as the manager to create a healthy sales culture focused on self-improvement and high performance. I, I've always felt like there are two styles of sales leadership in the world, spreadsheet managers and coaches. Spreadsheet managers aren't necessarily connected to their team's activities, but they're laser focused on the results. Coaches, they're right there on the sideline, ready to jump in and help when the time is right. Um, most sales managers are really probably a mixture of both, and that's that's where you want to be. But a lot of great managers, you know, you, they can slip into a pure spreadsheet style of leadership. And you know this is probably because there's so much to do in the modern world. It can, it can be exhausting to stay on top of everything going on, and exhausting to stay connected to your team and their performance. Um, but don't allow yourself to lose sight of what matters: the actual people on your sales team that you're leading. Smart coaching puts the team in a position to succeed because you're giving your reps the skills and abilities to win bigger and better deals by focusing on the most important part of their performance, who they are as salespeople. Managing a person isn't the same as managing a spreadsheet and understanding the difference is, it's an essential part of building a high performing sales team. Just like a, a great coach names team captains, you can deputize the reps in the team who are the strongest in a particular area to lead, to coach, and help you develop the rest of the team. Not only will it spread the skills of your top performers to the rest of the team, it will also help develop the next generation of sales leaders on your team. I hope this webinar was helpful to you guys and, and that you learned some tips that you can implement and, to improve your sales team's efficiency and their performance. If you'd like to hear more thoughts like these, I also have a podcast about the skills that field salespeople need called Outside Sales Talk. Uh, you can find it on all the all the podcasting platforms. Like I said, that, that podcast is called Outside Sales Talk. I, I have a bunch of free sales training videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, to find that, just Google the, the, Google the Badger Maps YouTube channel and they're just available there. Um, all right, well, let's go into the questions that you guys have submitted here. Cool, thanks Steve. Uh, on behalf of Zoho and Steve, thanks to each of you guys for joining. Um, hopefully you guys found it useful and we definitely wish the best for you, each and every one of you in your sales journeys. Um, so let's get to those, some questions. Um, we got one here that is, uh, <clears throat> why would a top rep 
want to take the time out of his or her day to actually help his peers be successful. So I guess um, is there you know taking time out of their at their ability to make more sales like what's the incentive? Yeah, I mean it, it's it's a good question. I I think the biggest incentive is um, well a I mean well, it's not that much time and they're, they're going to be in that group meeting anyway, so it's an opportunity for you know for them to be leading it because you're you're giving these. You're having them teach at a group meeting instead of you teaching because, you know, frankly, they're so good at it, right? At this one thing, um, people often like to help their peers, and uh, even though they're busy salespeople, but and they also they often they like the leadership opportunity. You know, a lot of salespeople really want to really want to be a leader in sales someday. They want to manage a team themselves, and and this is. This is the uh, the training wheels version of that. Great. Um, so another one is how often do you go throughout this exercise with sales sales teams? Monthly, biweekly, etc. I think it's ongoing. So, as a sales manager, you should be looking for just constantly looking for things that your sales team could do better. And then, you know, and, and, and thinking, oh, if everyone if everyone knew how to do this particular thing better, then, uh, you know, we would sell more stuff. And then you, so you you identify that thing, then you identify who's good at it, and then you have them teach that skill. But I, I think a lot of people, they make a big production out of this, and they want to, you know, take two days at the annual sales kickoff to do 20 skills in a row. And I think it's way more effective to to just kind of do it on an ongoing basis. Um, this one came early in the webinar. It was uh, where can we get some sample questions that you mentioned and how does the coach get better before approaching a sales team? Um, sample questions, hmm, what do they mean there? The Where can we get sample questions? Oh, like sample, I guess, I, I think they're probably referring to um, Questions to ask prospects. Um, I have a I have a video on on my uh, on my YouTube channel about how to prepare for a sales meeting that would that kind of goes into the questions in detail. Um, you know I'm I, I kind of reteach the same you know 15 20 things <laughs> in, in different formats and so you know I kind of summarized some of the things that that I teach in other places here. Uh, so I would, that's probably the, the best resource I, I could offer for, for that. Um, just Google Badger Maps YouTube and you'll end up on our YouTube channel. And you know, a lot of it's like training videos and stuff about the software. But if you go into channel, into playlists, there's a playlist that has like 12 training videos and one of them is about how to prepare for a sales call. And that'll, that'll dive deep into the questions. Uh, here's one. Uh, what types of skills do you look for when hiring your sales teams that maybe would transfer over to being good uh, uh, students um, to, to train and, and become better? Um, I, I think that this is where attitude and curiosity come into play when you're when you're hiring salespeople. You want to make sure they understand the sales process and they have all the requisite skills that but it's very it's actually very difficult to when you're interviewing salespeople to tell if they have certain skills like it's hard to figure out and and you know the people use try to use tricks for this sort of thing to like you know like when you're interviewing someone you can you can uh, mention oh here are the three things that I think sales reps are are re really make a sales rep at this company more successful and then, you know, 45 minutes later, you can be like, do you remember what those three things I, I said were the things that were, were the most important? <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's because it, it's kind of like a prospect, right? Like it's a conversation that's similar to, to if they're interacting with a prospect and a prospect says, these are the things that I think are most important to me. You know, if they remember those things, then they're then they're good at listening. And and uh, that's and if they don't, if they have no idea which what the things were, it's a bad thing. But it, it, but there's a lot of little tricks like that that you can use when you're interviewing. Um, but ultimately, you know, you want to try to identify if they like to learn, if they're curious, if they're, you know, energetic, um, if, if they kind of have a, 
you can kind of tell when someone's just got the right attitude and had and, and they're just committed to being someone who who is constantly looking to learn and better themselves and is coachable and is looking to continue to develop rather than just you know kind of punching the clock cool i think we have time for one more um if you identify a key skill that's important for your team's success, but none of your reps are really an expert in that skill, how would you go about teaching your whole team that skill? Yeah, that this is a tricky one, right? Like if you're like, oh, you know, this this thing is really important and I can tell we're weak at it, um, you know, prospecting or something, you can you can bring in an outside consultant or a sales trainer who has a particular expertise in that skill and, and have them teach the team. Um, there are also a whole bunch of uh, just resources out in the world. I feel like, you know, between all the sales thought leaders floating around in the world, there's a, a video that teaches you how to do almost everything that's available on, on YouTube, et cetera, to coach specific skills. Um, there are some and and there you know i i think that and and i'm non-biased here right like i'm not like a you know i run a software company i'm not you can't hire me to to be your sales coach or to come teach your sales team things but there are a ton of people like this and i often think that uh that you can like hire and bring in i i think that they're an undervalued asset like it might cost you know five ten grand to bring someone in to talk to teach your sales team something but if it if it's a key skill that you've that you've realized you you guys are lacking, if you shore up that skill, the team might make a million dollars more, you know, in the next year. So like the ten, five ten grand seems like 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 a lot to pay some sales expert to come and teach people stuff, but you know it's uh, it it often's worth it. I've it, I bring a lot of these guys. I know a lot of these people because I bring them on my podcast outside sales talk, and I'll I'll do like a. I'll have them cover some topic that I know they're an expert in for like 45 minutes. I'll like interview them. And so you can go through a lot by, you can go through that and see all the different topics that, that kind of are the skills that are floating around that either sales managers or sales teams need. And then you can see which person I hand picked to, to cover that topic. You can, and then you can listen to them doing like a, a, a brief, uh, you know, a 45 minute training on the topic and you can decide like, oh, I, I'd like to bring this person, um, I'd like to bring them bring them in and to have them go deeper. Or maybe you just have the team listen to that, to that issue of the podcast if it, if it really covers what you needed. Um, but I, you, you can find these guys easily, like, you know, they're, 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 they make themselves easy to find. So, but d definitely check out who covered what on my podcast. That's, that, that's a really helpful, I've, I've spent a lot of time kind of handpicking these guys. So it's, it's a helpful resource for, that's available for free for everybody.